Good morning, everyone. I hope you have had a good and blessed week. I am looking forward to getting into the scriptures here with you this morning, and I hope you're looking forward to getting into the scriptures as well. So let's pray, and then we will dive on into the Word. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for this past week. We thank you, Lord, for who you are. We thank you that you are a great God, that there is none like you in all the earth. Thank you that you care about us, that you love us, Lord. Father, we thank you uh, that you have chosen to reveal yourself to us in your word. And I pray, Lord, that your word would not just be something that just registers only in our minds, but that it would sink into our hearts as well. So I pray now that as we look into your word, Father, uh, that our hearts would just be like a sponge, that they would absorb uh, the truth, Lord. We thank you for the truth. That what, that what greater gift than the truth? And may our hearts be receptive of it. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, who is the truth. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, turn to Job chapter 2. Job chapter 2. A couple weeks back, we considered the fact, the reality, that in life there are very few certainties. Uh, but one of the certainties in life is that we will at some point in time walk through a valley of suffering. We will encounter hardship. It is not a question of if, it is a question of when. It applies to everyone. And when we consider this, uh, it only makes sense, it is only reasonable to conclude that the people in our lives who are very dear to us, whether it be a spouse, a family member, or a friend, uh, they too will suffer. It's not just that we will suffer, but our loved ones around us, they will eventually suffer as well. And when that happens, as it surely will, we are faced with the question of how do we go about comforting them. We want uh, to comfort them. We don't like seeing our loved ones suffer. We want to help alleviate their suffering. If we could, we would take it away, maybe even. Or we want to be of help to them. We want to be of service to them as they walk through their valley of suffering. What words do we speak? What do we say to them? What actions can we carry out uh, that will help alleviate their suffering? How do we go about comforting them? This is one of the things that we are going to consider this morning. We are going to look at Job's three friends who show up and how they went about comforting Job uh, as he suffered. We are going to look at three verses. That will be the main focus uh, of our attention here this morning. But we are going to focus on others as well as we go along. But mainly we are going to focus on Job chapter 2 verses 11 to 13. Three verses. And they read as follows. When Job's three friends, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Naamathite, heard about all the troubles that had come upon him, they set out from their homes and met together by agreement to go and sympathize with him and comfort him. When they saw him from a distance, they could hardly recognize him. They began to weep aloud and they tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads. Then they sat on the ground with him for seven days and nights. No one said a word to him, because they saw how great his suffering was. News of Job's suffering, it spread throughout the land. And this shouldn't come as a surprise to us, because Job was arguably, as Scripture would say, uh, he was the most prominent figure in his time. According to chapter 1 and verse 2, he was the greatest man among all the people of the East. He wasn't your average Job Lowe fellow. He was a very prominent individual, and so therefore it only makes sense that people would have heard about the suffering that he was experiencing. If a man in our world today of Job's prominence, uh, if he were to experience the kind of suffering uh, that Job experienced, people would be talking about it in the coffee shops. News anchors would be reporting on it. People would be sharing news articles about it on Facebook. News would get around very quickly, in fact. 
if a man of Job's prominence in our world today were to experience that kind of suffering. Of course, uh, there was no technology in Job's day. Uh, there was no internet, uh, there was no email, no phones, and so news uh, took longer to travel. Uh, but it did travel, and it eventually reached the ears of Job's three friends, Eliphaz, the Temanite, Bildad, the Shuhite, and Zophar, the Naamathite. These three men, these three friends of Job, they corresponded between one another, and they agreed to go and meet Job. In chapter 2, verses 11, it says, They set out from their homes and met together by agreement to go and sympathize with him and comfort him. Uh, we don't know how far their journey was to go visit Job. But when they eventually did arrive, they came upon a sight for sore eyes. They didn't find their friend Job in bed uh, with a nurse tending to his sores, his wounds. They didn't find that. It is believed by most commentators that Job, at this point, he'd actually taken up residence at the city dump. The commentator Warren Wearsby, he wrote this, so abhorrent was Job's appearance that he fled society and went outside the city and sat on the ash heap. There the city garbage was deposited and burned, and there the city's rejects lived, begging alms from whoever passed by. At the ash heap, dogs fought over something to eat, and the city's dung was brought and burned. The city's leading citizen was now living in abject poverty and shame. We might think that a typical meeting between good friends would involve warm smiles, uh, handshakes, hugs. We don't get the impression that this was the kind of meeting that took place when Job's three friends found Job in this terrible situation. In verse 12, the text says, When they saw him from a distance, they could hardly recognize him. They began to weep aloud, and they tore their clothes and sprinkled dust on their heads. Their friend Job, they could barely recognize him. This was how bad a shape he was in. This was how badly uh, the disease had taken its toll on Job's body. And his three friends, uh, they wept aloud, they tore their clothes, and they sprinkled dust on their heads, three things that they did there. And this was the way in which people mourned in this day and age. Uh, I think of the book of Esther, when Mordecai the Jew learned about the edict that had been carried out, or that was going to be carried out rather, against the Jews. Esther chapter 4 and verse 1 reads, When Mordecai learned of all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the city, wailing loudly and bitterly. Uh, this is the cultural way of mourning in this day and age. Job's three friends and Mordecai, uh, they wept aloud, tore their clothes, and put dust and ashes on. Uh, we, of course, don't do this in our world today. If we attend a funeral now, uh, we will wear dark co colored clothing. Uh, you don't show up to a funeral wearing a pink outfit. That's not culturally acceptable. Job's three friends, they did more than just this, though. Uh, they also, in verse 13, it said, Then they sat on the ground with him for seven days and nights. No one said a word to him, because they saw how great his suffering was. Just silence for seven days. Now, in the time remaining, I want to cover two points with you. I would like to look at what it is that Job's three friends did right, and what it is that Job's three friends did wrong. Now, we are often very quick to uh, criticize Job's three friends here. You're probably familiar with the saying, with friends like that, who needs enemies? And that's a bit of our attitude sometimes towards Job's three friends. But I would argue they weren't all bad. They did do some things right. 
And that's what we're going to look at here. So first of all, our first point, what Job's friends did right. What Job's friends did right. You know what these guys did right? One of the first things they did, they showed up. They showed up. When news of Job's suffering reached them, uh, they didn't go to the local store and get a sympathy card or a get well card and sign it and mail it off to him and then just go about their regular business. They actually left. Uh, they forgot about their own affairs. They left their homes and they traveled however far it was uh, to go and visit Job. Uh, there, of course, was no fast mode of transportation back in this day and age. Uh, you didn't have a plane that could fly a thousand kilometers an hour to get you there uh, right away. The traveling it took time. So these men sacrificed. They left their homes, traveled the distance uh, to come and see Job. And when they showed up, they mourned with him. The Apostle Paul in Romans 12 and verse 15, he says, Rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. This was what Job's three friends did. They showed up and they mourned with Job. Another thing that they did right, another thing they did right was they didn't say anything at all. They were silent. Verse 13. Then they sat on the ground with him for seven days and nights. No one said a word to him uh, because they saw how great his suffering was. Job's three friends, uh, they just kept quiet. Didn't say anything at all. And sometimes silence is the most appropriate way uh, to help comfort someone in their hour of suffering. The commentator Christopher Ashe, he wrote as follows, There is a time for saying nothing, a time when trauma so numbs feeling that words lose their use usefulness, when loss cauterizes the senses, and all someone can do is stare blankly into space, and all we can do is sit alongside and maybe hold a hand. When someone that you know, someone uh, who's maybe dear to you is suffering, sometimes uh, the best thing that you can do is just be there. Uh, be there, be a shoulder to cry on, and don't say anything at all. Hold their hand, just sit with them. Our words, uh, they are often empty and don't bring much comfort. Uh, we'll... Sometimes uh, we're prone to saying something like, uh, I know what you're going through. And a lot of times, vast majority of the time, uh, we have no sweet clue uh, what other people are walking through. Job's three friends, uh, they didn't know what, he was, what Job was going through. They hadn't been there themselves. And for them to say something like that uh, would not have been appropriate. I remember... Uh, some years ago, uh, I was talking to a friend who was going through a difficult time. And he was expressing this to me and what he was dealing with. And I was talking to him and trying to encourage him and, uh, you know, saying all kinds of things and uh, giving advice. And, and I look back now and I go, you know what, I probably would have been best just to have been quiet. I had no clue uh, what he was walking through. This is not to say that words are always inappropriate. Sometimes uh, words are appropriate, and sometimes words can be very helpful. I was listening to one, uh, one counselor talk, actually, and he said, uh, he said he was in a difficult time when his wife was dying of cancer, and a pastor came alongside him and reminded him of the fact that God loved his wife uh, more than he did. And the fellow said that that brought him a great deal of comfort. That meant a lot to him in that moment. So words are not altogether uh, inappropriate. They can uh, be very helpful 
in fact. But we need to be careful about the words that we speak. It's always a good idea uh, to think twice before we say something and to ask the Holy Spirit for guidance in that area. This brings us uh, to point number two. What Job's friends did wrong. They did speak. The problem was that the words that came out of their mouths were not overly helpful and they were not productive. They didn't help Job one bit. As well intentioned as they were, uh, Job's three friends, they actually ended up making matters worse, not better for Job. Their words had the opposite effect of what they were hoping. Uh, they set out to comfort him. Their words didn't comfort him. They didn't alleviate Job's suffering. Uh, they magnified it, in fact. And Job, uh, he more or less said as much. He grew quite frustrated with his friends along the way. They weren't helping him out, and he told them so, actually. In Job chapter six, 16 and verse 2, he says, You are miserable comforters, all of you. And this is not the only place where Job expresses his dissatisfaction uh, with his friends. In chapter 13, verses 4 to 5, he says, You smear me with lies. You are worthless physicians, all of you. If only you would be altogether silent. For you, that would be wisdom. Now, why did Job say these things about his friends? Why did he assess, them, uh, assess his friends in this in this rather harsh way. If you read through the book of Job, uh, if you read the remarks that Job's three friends made, uh, you will gather very quickly that their line of reasoning, they're trying to tell Job why he is suffering here. They're trying to make sense of this here. And their line of reasoning is that if a person is suffering, it is because they've sinned, and therefore they are deserving of the suffering. The suffering is a form of punishment. This was the thinking that largely dominated their day and age. It's a cause and effect relationship. Uh, if you sin, uh, suffering will come upon you. Uh, right away, in fact. We see this thinking in the New Testament as well. Uh, John chapter 9, and verses 1 to 3. This is in reference to Jesus. As he went along, he saw a blind man from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Uh, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. This man is suffering. Someone must have sinned to cause this suffering. That was the disciples' thinking. That is the thinking of Job's three friends here. Job is suffering because he has sinned. Which, of course, goes against what we learned in the very first message, the very first sermon. Job, he's a godly man. He's a godly man. And we know the conversation that took place in heaven between Satan and God. Job's suffering is not because he has sinned here. Job is not suffering because of something he did wrong. He's suffering because of everything that he did right. But in, his, in the minds of his three friends, Job is suffering because of what he had done wrong. Now, I'm not going to labor this point too much because I actually want to return to it at a later time and go into a bit more depth. Uh, but this was the reasoning of Job's three friends. And I'll just give you a couple scripture references here that, uh, that'll make the point. Uh, Job chapter 4, verses 7 to 8. This is Eliphaz speaking. Consider now, who, being innocent, has ever punished? Where were the upright ever destroyed? As I have observed, those who plow evil and those who sow trouble, reap it. In other words, Job has sinned, and he's now paying for it. He has plowed evil, and he is now reaping uh, trouble. In chapter 5, verse 17, this is Eliphaz again. Blessed is the one whom God corrects, so do not despise the discipline of the Almighty. What's Eliphaz's thinking here? Well, Job has sinned, and God has correct. God is now disciplining him. He's correcting him, and it is true that God disciplines those 
that he loves. Scripture makes that clear, but that is not what is going on here in the case of Joel. God is not disciplining him here. Eliphaz, uh, his analysis is completely incorrect. Job chapter 8, verses 3 to 6. This is Bildad speaking. Does God pervert justice? Does the Almighty pervert what is right? When your children sinned against him, he gave them over to the penalty of their sin. But if you will seek God earnestly and plead with the Almighty, if you are pure and upright, even now he will rouse himself on your behalf and restore you to your prosperous state. A Bildad, he actually take things a little, takes things a, little, uh, a step further here. Job has sinned and he's now reaping the destruction, uh, the punishment that is being brought on him because of his sin. And not only that, but his kids, Job's ten kids. Bildad here, he says, the text reads, When your children sinned against them, uh, when your children sinned against him, he gave them over to the penalty of their sin. Job's, uh, his kids have sinned and that was why destruction came upon them. That's the reasoning, that is the thinking here. And I would say that if you're going to try and comfort someone, uh, the least you can do is bring some good theology to the table. Uh, there is an element of truth to what these men are saying. Uh, God does punish sin. But that's not the only explanation for suffering. In the minds of his three friends, this is the only explanation. You must have sinned. That's not the case. We know that's not the case with Job. It's not a great way to comfort someone either. Someone's going through a difficult time. It's not necessarily the best thing to come in uh, with a preconceived notion of why things are going wrong in their lives. Job's three friends, uh, they turned out to be lousy, miserable comforters. Which is interesting because they didn't set out to be that. Chapter 2, verse 11 they set out from their homes and met together by agreement to go and sympathize with him and comfort him. Started out well-intentioned, and they were doing great to start with. They showed up. They deserve credit. They deserve points for that. They went out of their way. Uh, they left their homes behind, their family behind, their work behind. And they traveled to go and sit with their friend and to mourn with him. They showed up. They're a good example to us in this way. But they would have done better if they had just kept quiet. The commentator, uh, the commentator Robert Alden, he said this, Good counselors know that sometimes the best thing they can do is simply listen. Just the presence of a sympathetic person can provide comfort altogether apart from any spoken words. This probably was the finest demonstration of love these three could have shown. If they had simply returned home without saying anything, their reputations would be much different. Now, I don't believe that this necessarily means that Job's three friends should have just sat there and said nothing. In light of the things that they did say, it would have been better if they would have said nothing. But it wouldn't have been inappropriate either for them to say things that were actually beneficial. Uh, things that were helpful. Job's three friends, uh, they were there. This was what they did right. They left behind their work, their families, they left behind uh, everything and they traveled to go and meet with Job. They're an example to us uh, in this way. They were there for Job, and we need uh, to be there for those who are suffering as well. We need to be there with them. We need to be there for them. We need to make sure uh, that those who are suffering know uh, we are there with them. It may mean sitting with them, 
It may mean uh, sending them a text message, uh, calling them just to let them know that we are praying for them, that we are thinking of them. It may mean offering a word of encouragement along the way. It may mean taking them out for a cup of coffee and just listening. Letting them know we're there with them and we are there for them. God, uh, He is with us in our darkest valleys. He doesn't leave us. He doesn't forsake us. It may seem sometimes when we are in the darkness that we are alone, that God is not there, that He has abandoned us. That is not the case. He was there with Job, though Job didn't necessarily feel it. God is there with us. He is there for us. And we need to be there with those who are suffering as well. We're the body of Christ. If one part hurts, the other part hurts as well. We're all in this together, folks. We're all in this together. Uh, we are to be helping one another, building each other up, encouraging one another as we go uh, through this life together. And especially as we go through the darkest valleys together. We need to be there for one another. And I pray uh, that the Lord will give us wisdom in knowing how to help. How to help one another uh, through the dark uh, valleys of suffering. Job's three friends, they started out well. They didn't really finish very well. In fact, as we will see later on, God actually gets upset with Job's three friends. We want to start well. We want to be there for those who are suffering. And when the time comes to say something, should that time arise, we want it to be words that are beneficial, words that are productive, Words that actually do bring comfort, unlike the words that Job's three friends had to offer. That is what we want to do. So I hope you have been blessed by this. And next week we are going to consider the darkness that Job found himself in. His initial response was very positive. As the trial wore on, his spirits started to grow dark. And so we're going to look at that next week, and I hope that you can join us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Uh, Lord, we want to be of help. Our, our hearts want to reach out to those. Uh, we want to reach out to those who are suffering, Lord. And sometimes we just don't know how to do it. I pray that you would help us, Lord, just give us wisdom to know how we can comfort those who are suffering around us. Pray that the words that we offer, that they would not be words that hurt, that they would be words of encouragement, Lord, that they would build others up, not tear them down. So give us wisdom. We look to you, Father, uh, for the words to say. May you speak uh, to the suffering, Lord, to those who are hurting. May you speak to them through us, Lord. Use us, Lord. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.